Hello and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. If you are a first time viewer, please stick around for the intro. It is worth the time at least once. If you are a regular viewer, feel free to skip ahead using the annotation. So first, a few things. I do these videos because I love to learn and help others learn. We are all good at something. So I encourage you to give back to the world in a similar way. Share your passion, whatever it is, any way you can. Now this video focuses on basic stats and is not a quick fix. It aims to be thorough. My goal is an understanding of fundamental concepts and that takes time. But when you understand the fundamentals, learning other topics is much easier. Now related to that, if you're watching because you're struggling in a class or at work, I want you to stay positive and keep your head up. You can learn this. I have faith in you. Many other people around you have faith in you. And so should you. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, Google+, Twitter, and of course subscribe here on YouTube. Now if you think there is something I can do better, please leave a constructive comment below. I do take those comments into account when I make new videos. I also encourage you to talk with other viewers in the comments. Help each other when you can. And finally, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with classmates or colleagues and put it on a playlist for review later. That does encourage me to keep making them for you. So let's go ahead and start learning. So this video is the next in our series about multiple regression. Now it's really an extension of part four. And in part four, we looked at the case where we had one dummy variable. In this video, we're going to extend that to two dummy variables. We will see how to set up the problem. We will see how to conduct the analysis and then interpret our result in the end. Now, if you did not watch part four, I highly recommend going back and watching it before proceeding with this one. So that small warning aside, let's go ahead and get started. So as in the last video, you are an analyst for a small company that develops house pricing models for independent realtors. To generate your models, you use publicly available data such as the list price, the square footage, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, among other data points that you collect. Now in this problem, you're interested in two main questions. Number one, is the public high school in the neighborhood exemplary, which is the highest rating? And how is that rating related to the home price, if at all? Number two, what region, so north, south, east, or west of the city, is the home located? And how is that related to the home price, if at all? Now you'll notice that this data is not quantitative. It is qualitative. They are categories. In the first case, the high school is either exemplary or it's not. It's a yes or no question. In the second case, it's just the region or the directions of north, south, east, or west. So because we have categorical data, we will need to use dummy variables in a regression to conduct this analysis. So in this problem, we are going to use 100 fictitious observations. I did make up this data for this video. So here are the first 15 observations. Let's go ahead and look at our data structure. In the first column, we have our dependent variable, which is price. So the first home is 450,000 US dollars. Now in the second column, we have our first independent variable. That's the square footage. So that first home is 3,860 square feet. It's a very big home. In the third column, we have our second independent variable. And that is whether or not the high school is exemplary or not. So it's either yes or no. And then in the fourth column, we have our third independent variable, which is region. So north, south, east, or west. And that's how our data was originally collected. Now the first thing we're going to do is some recoding. We're going to change our text entries, such as yes, no, north, south, east, or west, into numerical values. And we can do that like this. So for exemplary high school, if it's a yes, we code that as one. If it's a no, we code that as zero. Now for location, we do it a bit differently. I'm going to code these in alphabetical order. And I do that to make Minitab happy, which I'll talk about later. So east is the first alphabetical region. So we'll give that a code of zero. And then we have north, which is a code of one. Then we have south, which is a code of two. And finally, we have west, which is a code of three. So up to this point, we've gone from text entries to numerical entries. 
but we have not created our dummy variables yet. We're going to go ahead and do that now. So here we have what I call dummification. So the price column is the same, the square footage column is the same, the exemplary high school column is the same. But now we have three dummy variables, south, west, and north. Now you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, we have four locations, north, south, east, and west, but we only have three dummy variables. Well, if you remember from part four, our number of dummy variables is always the number of categories minus one. So we have four categories, north, south, east, west, minus one is three. So we have three dummy variables. Now I think it's pretty straightforward to see how these are coded. So for the first home, we have it as being in the south region. So over here on the right, for south, we put a one under the south column. Now for the second home, it's in the north region. So in that case, we put a one in the north column and the other regions are zero. So you can kind of see how this works, but you'll notice that there's no column for east. Now by far the most important thing, the most valuable thing you can do before you ever run a test, before you ever crunch the numbers or anything, is to look at some scatter plots of your data. So here we have the price of the home versus its square footage. Along the x-axis at the bottom we have the square footage, and on the y-axis on the left we have the price. Now we can see that this is a pretty linear relationship. If we just sort of eyeballed a best fit line, we would see that it runs sort of through the middle of the data. Now I would argue that this is probably a curvilinear relationship, but in this case we are doing linear regression. We'll talk about non-linear regression at a later point. But we can see that this is a definite pattern of a smaller home having a smaller price and larger homes having larger prices. Now this scatter plot is a bit more interesting as it separates out our data into groups. So as you can see, the blue dots represent homes where the high school is not exemplary, and the red squares represent homes where the high school is exemplary. Now you can see a definite pattern here. Look at the blue dots, where are they? Well, they are definitely along the bottom of this scatter plot. So especially if you look from about 2,000 square foot homes up to 3,000 square foot homes, the blue dots are consistently below the red squares. Now we can go ahead and put some lines just sort of eyeball it, and there they are. So let's step back and look at the big picture. Let's take a average home that is 2,500 square feet. Now we can see that for a home that's 2,500 square feet, the price of a home where the high school is not exemplary, the blue dots in line, is about $150,000. Now for the same size home, 2,500 square feet, if the high school is exemplary, the home is a little bit over $200,000. So for the same size home, the only difference being whether the high school is exemplary or not, we have a price difference of over $50,000. So we can think of that as the exemplary high school premium price. Given the same size home, the one where the high school is exemplary demands a price that is about $50,000 more. And I find things like that very interesting. So let's go ahead and keep that in the back of our minds as we go forward. So here we have a very busy graph. Here we're looking at the regions on the same basic scatter plot. So we have east, which are blue dots, north, which are red squares, south, which are green diamonds, and west, which is purple triangles. So what general patterns do we see here? Well, it looks like the west homes, the purple triangles, stay along the bottom of the scatter plot, the north homes kind of stay along the top of the scatter plot, and then you know the other ones, the east and the south, kind of stay in the middle of the scatter plot. So let's help ourselves out by putting some best fit lines on this graph. Now that's a bit easier to read. So we can learn a ton of information just from this scatter plot. So let's look at the west homes first. So those are the purple triangles. As we can see, they're along the bottom of the scatter plot. They start at around 1,500 square foot. The largest one is about 3,500 square feet. Now the price does not increase as steeply as the other regions. You can see that the slope of the purple line, of the dashed line, 
is quite a bit shallower than the slope of the other three lines. So in the west region, as the homes get larger, the price doesn't go up as much as the other regions. Now let's look at the green, the south region. So we have the green diamonds. Now there, the smallest home is about 2,000 square feet, and they go all the way up to almost 4,000 square feet. Now, look at the slope of that line. It is extremely steep. So as the homes get bigger, the price shoots up very rapidly as compared to the other regions. So we can sort of see the difference here. In the West, we have smaller homes that are less expensive. The price increases less as the home gets bigger. In the opposite extreme, we have the South region where the homes start a bit bigger. And as they get bigger, the price goes up dramatically. And then we have the other two, the East and the North, which kind of hang around in the middle. So we can definitely see the relationship between square footage, the size of the home, and the price as separated out by region. So keep that in mind as we go forward. So here we're gonna look at a surface plot. Now, the purists out there, I'm going to note, because I know you're gonna say something probably, that this is not the best use of a surface plot, and I know that. I'm just using this as a visual tool to show the difference in price and square footage across another variable. So here we have a surface plot of price versus square foot in three dimensions and exemplary high school. So you can see that we have the price in the vertical axis, we have the square footage in the Z axis, front to back, then we have the exemplary high school category running along the X axis here in the front. Here's the question. Is the surface tilted downward where the exemplary high school equals zero? So down here in the lower left corner, is this sort of tilted down and to the left? So if we're looking at this from the front view, if we were standing right where it says exempt high school, exempt HS down here at the bottom, if we stood there and looked at it, would it look like this? Would it start at the bottom and then kind of slope up, up towards where we have one? Well, I would say yes. So what does that tell us? That tells us that as we go from zero to one, from a not exemplary high school to an exemplary high school, the price and the square footage both tend to increase. So this three-dimensional plane is sort of tilted down here at 0.0, .0 and kind of goes up as we go to the right and somewhat to the back. And that's how we can use this 3D plot to visualize our data. And again, it's not the proper use of a 3D plot, but it does help us visualize this in three dimensions. So here's a surface plot of price and square foot again, but this time location is here in the front axis. So what are we looking for here? Now, are there front to back, what I would call sort of mountain ranges at any location? So do they run front to back like this? Does any location have higher prices across the surface taking into account the square footage. Well, what do you think about that? Well, I think they all tend to follow the same basic pattern, or most of them do. We can definitely tell that the east region, front to back, has that one spike at around 3,000 square foot. The south kind of goes up as it proceeds to the back. The west region, however, really increases in price and square footage as it goes to the, towards the back, and the north maybe a little bit less so. So here we can see that the west region, it seems like, has the biggest change in square footage and price as we increase both of those dimensions. Okay, so this is probably the most complicated slide in this uh, presentation, so I wanna do it real slow so you understand where everything is coming from. So here is our estimated regression equation. So we have the expected value of y, which is our dependent variable, equals beta sub zero, which is our intercept, and then we have our series of independent variables, from beta one x one all the way up to beta five x five. Now remember, these all stand for something. So we have our constant, which is our intercept, and then beta one x one is our coefficient, and then x one is our square footage variable, then x two is our exemplary high school variable, and then south, west, and north are our dummy variables, and we can think of those kind of as a group. 
So here are all of our variables as represented in our estimated regression equation. Now let's look at an example. What's the expected value of the home price given that the high school is not exemplary? So in that case, x2 is zero. If you look up here for exemplary high school at the top, that's our x2 variable. So if it's not exemplary, we know that that value is a zero. And the home is in the west. So remember for x4, that's our west dummy variable, so that would be a one in that spot. So we can write this out using some notation. So the expected value of y, our dependent variable given, that's sort of the vertical line pipe there, that it's not exemplary and it's in the west, equals beta zero plus beta one x one plus, remember that's our square footage, plus beta two x two. But in this case, x two is zero because the high school is not exemplary. Then we have beta three zero, well, why is that? That's because the home is not in the south. Then we have beta four times one. Well, why is that a one? That's because our home is in the west. If we look up there, we have beta four x four, where the west is, so that's a one. Then we have beta five zero, that's a zero. Well, why? Because the home is not in the north. So what we can do is actually do some simple algebra here and reduce this down to this. So we have beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta four. Now where does that come from? Well, if you look at the one above it, anything that's multiplied by zero goes away. So beta two goes away, beta three goes away, and beta five goes away because they're all multiplied by zero. So we're left with beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta four, because beta four times one is beta four itself. So that is our simplified estimated regression equation for this particular example. So what are the total number of possible equations we could actually have in this problem? Well, we're always going to have one constant, which is our beta zero, times our one square foot variable, that's just a simple quantitative variable, times two for our exemplary high school variable. It can take the value of a one or zero. So in that spot, we have two possibilities. It's either one or zero. Now for the region, we have four possibilities. So in this case, we could have one zero zero, which is south. We could have zero one zero, which is west. We could have zero zero one, which is north. Or we could have zero zero zero, which is a home in the east region. So we multiply all these possibilities for each part of our estimated regression equation, we have eight possible equations in this multiple regression model with these two dummy variables. So one times one is one, times two for two possibilities, for example, your high school, times four possibilities for the region, which we can see over here on the right. One times one times two times four is eight. And we'll actually see all eight of these equations here in a minute or two.